بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد Today Wednesday the 3rd of Muharram 1435 corresponding to the 6th of November 2013 we begin with the 9th lesson of the book Essential Lessons for Every Muslim by Sheikh Al-Allama Abdul Aziz ibn Abdullah ibn Baz rahimahullah ta'ala إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Before going into detail about today's lesson which will cover the conditions of لا إله إلا الله and also a brief look at the remaining or remaining pillars of Islam uh, I think it's important to note that today is the second of Muharram. Now I know on the calendar it says it's the third of Muharram, but uh, as there was an official announcement yesterday, yesterday was the first of Muharram. I mean, that is that Dhul Hijjah went 30 days, not 29 days as it was on the calendar. Because there was no evidence, there was no sighting that mentioned that uh, or that there was no sighting, so therefore the Hijjah completed 30 days, even though on the calendar is 29 days. That means today is the second of Muharram, and next Thursday, next Thursday, inshallah ta'ala, next week, Thursday, will be the 10th of Muharram, Yom Ashura. And the Prophet وسلم, said in a hadith collected by an Imam Muslim that the best of fast after Ramadan is the fast of Shahrullah al-Muharram is the fast in Muharram yani that is that a person should increase his fasting in this month of Muharram in general but especially especially the 10th of Muharram Yom Ashura now this is actually a day that Quraysh and some of the other Arabs prior to Islam, they used to fast. This comes to Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. And they would fast this day of Ashura. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma says that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam went to Medina, he found the Jews fasting on Ashura. And he asked them what it is that they are fasting Ashura for. And they said that it is the day that Allah saved Musa and destroyed Fir'aun. It is the day that Allah saved Musa and his people and destroyed Fir'aun and his people. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ana ahaqqu bi Musa minkum. I have more right to Musa than you do. I mean, that is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is following the unadulterated teachings that have come from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that is from revelation. And the deen of Musa is the same, of, uh, same as the deen of all of the prophets who came before him. And the deen of our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the same deen. The sharia may be different in certain aspects. But in terms of the deen itself, that is the creed that the Muslim holds, then it is the same. As the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, نَحْنُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ إِخْوَةٌ لِعِلَّاتِ That we, the, that is the, the prophets, are maternal brothers. Dinuna wahid. Yani that our religion, that our way is the same. That our mothers are different. Yani that is that the sharia or the legislations that they have are different in certain aspects. So the Prophet ﷺ told the Jews that I have more of a right to Musa than you do. 
فَصَامَهُ وَأَمَرَ بِصَوْمِهِ As Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma said, So he fasted that day, that is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he fasted Yom Ashura, and he commanded the Muslims with fasting it, with fasting that day. And so the fast of Ashura used to be wajib for the Muslims before the fasting of Ramadan became wajib. Then after that, the Prophet ﷺ left it as it was. For those who want to fast, they can fast. And for those who do not want to fast, then they do not have to fast it. But the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنِّي لَا أَحْتَسِبُ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنْ يُكَفِّرَ السَّنَةَ الْمَاضِيَةِ يعني إِنْ يُكَفِّرَ السَّنَةَ الَّتِي قَبْلَهَا For the person who fasts the day of Ashura, that is the 10th of Muharram, which is next Thursday. Next Thursday. Then the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah will expiate the sins of the previous year for that person who fast on Ashura. Now what we need to understand from this is that when the texts come to talk about expiation of sins, like the Prophet ﷺ said, from one salah to the next salah is a kafara lima bainahuma. From Ramadan to Ramadan is a kafara lima bainahuma. Al umrah ila al umrah kafara lima bainahuma. As it comes in the majority of the narrations. As long as one avoids the major sins, the kabair, the major sins. Major sins a person has to make specifically, make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those sins. He has to feel regret, he has to leave them off, he has to have firm determination not to return back to those things. But as for the minor sins that one commits, then they are erased by these good deeds in al hasanat yudhibun as sayyiat that the good deeds remove the evil deeds they get rid of the evil deeds so this fasting on this day of ashura is a great thing that the muslims all over the world do and should do for those of who do, those who do not do it they should do it the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also said about this issue of fasting ashura he said, لَإِنْ لَإِنْ عِشْتُ إِلَى الْقَابِلْ أَوْ بَقِيْتُ إِلَى الْقَابِلْ لَأَصُمَّنَّ التَّاسِعِ If I live to the following year, the Prophet ﷺ said, then I will fast the ninth as well. That is the ninth of Muharram. Today, today officially is the second of Muharram. So next Wednesday, next Wednesday is going to be the ninth. And the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to fast the ninth to be different from the Jews. And that is part of this deen. The Prophet ﷺ intentionally did things on Hajj, for example, that were different than the way that the pagans made the Hajj. Not to mention the ibadah itself being solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these type of يعني, these internal elements of the ibadah. But also externally, the Prophet ﷺ wanted us to be different from the Jews and the Christians and idolaters and otherwise. So this is an encouragement for myself, for all of those who are listening to make sure that we plan appropriately so that we can fast at least next Wednesday and next Thursday, if not even more than that, because again, this is the most beloved month to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that one fasts in it besides the month of Ramadan. Besides the month of Ramadan. Tell you, Father Nash. Qala Shaykh Rahmahullah Ta'ala. As for the conditions of La ilaha illallah, they are as follows. One, knowledge that negates ignorance. Two, certainty which negates any doubt. Three, worshipping of sincerity, which negates any type of shirk. Four, truthfulness, that negates hypocrisy. Five, love, which negates any type of hatred. Six, application of its teachings, which negates leaving them off. Seven, that is, he accepts it in a manner that negates re uh, rejection. Eight, and to reject everything that is worshipped besides Allah, these conditions have been combined in the following two lines of poetry Almun Yaqeen wa Ikhlas wa Sidqu Kama Mahabbatin wa Inqiyadin wa Qabuli Laha wa Zida Thamin wa Al Kufran wa Minka Bima Siwa Al Ilahi Min Al Ashia Iqad Uliha. 
knowledge, certainty, sincerity, and truthfulness with love and application and accepting it. An eighth has been added, which is your rejection of every deity that has been worshipped besides Allah. Also clarifying the testimony that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, which includes to believe everything that he informed us of, obedience to him. All right, we'll deal with the conditions and then go to that, inshallah. Tayyip, the author, rahimahullah ta'ala, is clarifying the conditions for the acceptance of la ilaha illallah. Yesterday we talked about the meaning of la ilaha illallah. And that it means, or that la ilaha illallah comprises both negation and affirmation. That one negates the right of anything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be worshipped. And that he affirms that worship is solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that this is the meaning of la ilaha illallah. La ilaha, no deity. And then we have some omitted speech. Is worshipped in truth illallah except Allah. And that this is the meaning of la ilaha illallah. Today we're going to talk about the conditions because there are a lot of people who might think that just by saying la ilaha illallah that that is enough to get one into Jannah even if they don't understand the meaning even if they don't act according to it or whatever they say whoever says la ilaha illallah goes to Jannah because there are a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says things like this and so therefore all somebody has to do is say la ilaha illallah and that's enough this is enough for one to go to Jannah and this is because this is because many people just pick and choose what they want from the deen and they don't gather up the text yani when we look at something when we look at an issue in islam then it's not sufficient for us if you wanted to learn about something anything outside of islam you wanted to learn about biology or chemistry or anything like this is it enough for you to just read one book or one paragraph from that book? Usually people are going to gather up different texts, okay? And they're going to cross-reference and they're going to look at everything about the topic so that they can get a good understanding. And it's the same thing in Islam. When we want a proper understanding of something, we have to look at the different things that the Prophet ﷺ may have said about an issue. And even before that would have, what has come in the Quran about that particular issue. So, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah has conditions in order for it to be accepted. If you were, I'll give you an example because we all know what conditions mean, but let's just, let's just make it all the more clear for la ilaha illallah. If you were a math teacher, a math teacher, you taught math, mathematics, and you gave the students an exam, and the exam was a multiple choice exam, A, B, C, D, okay? But you told them, in order to get the marks, you have to show your work. Have you ever heard that statement? Show your work. Show how you got the answer. Don't just circle because maybe you looked at someone else's paper and you circled. No, I want to see the work. How did you get the answer? And so a student comes, question number one, the answer is A, he wrote an A. Question two, the answer is C, he wrote C. He gives it to the teacher with no work on the paper. All of the answers are correct. But will that student get any points? No. Why not? Because they didn't fulfill the condition that the teacher gave them. That condition is that you have to show the work in order to get the points. It doesn't matter if the answer is right. And here we have the same concept. Yes, la ilaha illallah is the key to Jannah. But there are conditions for that key to work. So it's not enough, it's not enough just to say la ilaha illallah. There are conditions. And these conditions were understood by the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu and the early scholars of Islam. There was a famous tabi'i. A tabi'i is one who studied with the companions. And the early scholar, he studied his, his uh, tabi, he means that his sheikh was the companion of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There was an early tabi, 
or an early scholar of Islam from the Tabi'in. His name was Wahb ibn Munabbi, a great scholar of Islam. And someone came to him and said to him, Alaysa Miftahul Jannah, La ilaha illallah. Isn't the key to paradise, La ilaha illallah, isn't, isn't La ilaha illallah the key to paradise? He said, Bala, Bala, Walakin Laysa Miftahun illa lahu asnan. He said, That's correct. La ilaha illallah is the key to Jannah. But there is no key except that it has what they call bits, teeth, ridges, grooves, okay? A key is two parts. The part that you stick into the lock, that part is called the blade, okay? And then you have the outer part that you control, that's called the bow. So the blade that you put in, it's cut, okay? And if it's not cut the right way, it's not going to open the door. It's not going to unlock the lock. So he says to them, yes, la ilaha illallah is the key. It is the key to Jannah. But there is no key except that it has these ridges. For in jitta bi miftahin, bi miftahin lahu asnan futiha lak. Wa illa lam yuftah lak. So if you come with the key that has the right grooves in it, the right ridges, then the door will open for you. And if you don't, then it's not going to open. It's not going to open. So this is from the early times of Islam, that they recognized that it's not just la ilaha illallah like that, just one saying it. And this is something that is agreed upon by all the scholars of Islam, is something that is known from the Quran and from the Sunnah, from consensus of the scholars, and likewise from one's intellect. It's logical. Because as we talked about yesterday, for example, if someone was just to say la ilaha illallah, they went to someone who doesn't speak Arabic, doesn't know any Arabic, doesn't know what he's saying, and they say, listen, just I want you to repeat after me, like they would with a parrot, for example. And they say, la, la, ilaha, ilaha. Okay, after that, when a person finally says, la ilaha illallah, does it benefit them anything? They don't even know what they're saying. They're just like an animal, like a parrot, for example. Then no. Everyone knows that this doesn't benefit that individual. Al-Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah ta'ala, another great scholar from most the tabi'i, he saw a man who was burying his wife at the graveyard. And he said to him, Ma a'adadta li hadha al-yawm. What have you prepared for this day? Not the day that they were living, but yani, what have you prepared for the day when you are going to also be put into the grave? So, the man said to Al-Hasan al-Basri, Shahadatu an la ilaha illallah mundu sabaeen sana. I've prepared the testimony of la ilaha illallah for over 70 years, for 70 years now. This is what I've prepared. And Al-Hasan told him, he said, Ni'ma al-Udda. He said, this is a great thing that you have prepared. What a great thing that you have prepared. فَإِنَّ لِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ شُرُوطًا Okay, but لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ has conditions. هَذَا الْعَمُودِ فَأَيْنَ الطُّنُبِ This is the pillar, right, for the tent. Yani he's given an example of a tent. When you put up a tent, you put down the, the, the main pillar first. He said, but where are the ropes? Where are the ropes that you use that go from the main tent that the tarps go around or whatever you need for the tent to actually stick into the ground to make a tent? Otherwise, not a tent. So he says, this is la ilaha illallah. Okay, this is your amul. But where are the ropes that are going to actually make this into a tent? In other words, they have the, the conditions for la ilaha illallah have to be fulfilled in order for this statement to be beneficial. So what we're going to talk about today, bi-idnillahi ta'ala, are the conditions of la ilaha illallah. And this doesn't mean that you have to memorize the conditions or that you simply learn it for the sake of passing it on to other people. 
but you need to look at yourself and make sure that you have fulfilled these conditions in your statement of la ilaha illallah and when you say la ilaha illallah have you fulfilled these conditions or not Tayyip. The conditions are seven conditions. The author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, mentions an eighth condition, and I'll talk about that when we finish. But the majority of the scholars of Islam have said that the conditions are seven. And the reason why they differ is that some of them uh, yani expand on certain aspects or merge other aspects. Because you may find some scholars that say they're five or six. But seven is the general number that is accepted. And it has been gathered in two lines of poetry in the Arabic language and I'll mention them and translate them and then we'll go into each one one by one inshallah ta'ala the point is that there are seven conditions that have been indicated by the Quran and the Sunnah by the Sharia there are seven conditions to la ilaha illallah if one does not fulfill these conditions then la ilaha illallah will not benefit him and we need to be aware of this aspect. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the people who benefit from their statement, La ilaha illallah. Because we don't just want to live our lives with La ilaha illallah, not understanding these conditions. And so the conditions are as follows. Al-ilmu wal-yaqeenu wal-qabulu wal-inqiyadu fadri ma aqulu wal-sidku wal-ikhlasu wal-mahabba wa-faqaq Allahu lima ahabba. So the poet here, he says, Al-ilm, knowledge. Any knowledge of la ilaha illallah and what it means. Okay? Al-yaqeen. Certainty. Certainty. I'm going to talk about these in detail. Knowledge and certainty. Al-qabool. That one accepts it. That one accepts la ilaha illallah. Wal-inqiyadu. Likewise, he complies. He complies to la ilaha illallah and what it indicates by way of obligations and duties. So know what I am saying to you. This is what the poet says. Knowledge, certainty, acceptance, compliance or application. So know what I am saying. As-sidq wal-ikhlas wal-mahabba. So this is number five. As-sidq. That one is truthful in his statement. That one statement coincides with what is in his heart. Wasidku wal ikhlas and that he is sincere in that statement. Wal mahabba and that he loves the statement of La ilaha illallah and what it indicates. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you to that which he loves. That is the end of the two lines of poetry. So we're going to take them one by one, inshallah ta'ala. The first of the conditions of la ilaha illallah is al-ilm. That is knowledge. That a person must have knowledge of the meaning of la ilaha illallah. And we discussed this. We discussed the meaning of La ilaha illallah in detail yesterday. And that it is both negation and affirmation. That a person must negate and disassociate and reject everything that is worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that he affirms and singles out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. And that this is the meaning of La ilaha illallah, that there is no deity that is worthy of worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now how do we know that this is a condition? Well first of all, as we mentioned before, it's obvious that it's a condition. It's obvious, badahi as they say. You don't even need evidence for this point. It's like saying, how do you know the sun is hot? Or how do you know fire is hot? It's something that you automatically know. So you know that you have to know what la ilaha illallah means for it to be, for it to count and for it to be worth anything. Because a testimony, as we talked about, a shahada without knowledge is not a true testimony. It's unacceptable testimony. But even with that, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكْ Allah Azza wa Jal told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as it comes in Surah Muhammad, know, fa'lam, 
have knowledge of the fact that la ilaha illallah. So you need to know that la ilaha illallah and seek forgiveness for your sins. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, illa man shahida bil haqqi wa hum ya'lamun. Except for those who bear witness, testify to the truth. What do the scholars of Tafsir say the truth is? They say the truth is the statement of La ilaha illallah. So except for those who bear witness to the truth, La ilaha illallah wa hum ya'lamun. And they know, and they know. Meaning that they know the meaning of La ilaha illallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I want you to listen to this hadith and see how it relates to what preceded. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man mata. This hadith is Sahih Muslim. Man mata. وَهُوَ يَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever dies and he knows that لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That there is no deity worthy of worship except for Allah enters Jannah. This hadith was narrated by Uthman ibn Affan رضي الله عنه It's in Sahih Muslim. طيب If someone just took this hadith and they didn't look at anything else that the Prophet ﷺ said about this topic. So he says, listen, there's this person I was talking to Islam, I was talking to them about Islam. And uh, he says, hey, he believes everything that I was telling him. So Islam is a great religion, it's the truth. But he doesn't say, La ilaha illallah. Then what have we said previously? That this person doesn't enter into Islam. Even if, he's, even if inside, he says, yeah, I believe that. But he doesn't say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, then this person has not entered into the fold of Islam. Someone else comes and says, no, but no, no. The Prophet said, whoever dies, and he knows la ilaha illallah, then he goes to Jannah. Even if he, even if he doesn't, Say it. See, this is this what happens when one picks and chooses what they want from the hadith. So they just take this one hadith and they don't look at all the other hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu talked about shahada to an la ilaha illallah. To bear witness. And that bearing witness has to be with the tongue. And so we gain this from gathering up yani, the different texts that relate to a particular field. So the first condition for a person for a person who testifies to la ilaha illallah, for that testimony to benefit him, is that he must have knowledge of the meaning of la ilaha illallah. This is what makes knowledge a requirement. Tell you, the second condition is certainty. Certainty. What, is, what does this mean? And what is the difference between knowledge and certainty? Well, we know that certainty is when one has very firm knowledge that doesn't waver in the heart. So he has undeniably, he knows that la ilaha illallah is the truth. Okay, here he is certain about the truth of the statement la ilaha illallah. Now there's a difference. There's a difference. Because there are some people that you may talk to about Islam. And they understand what la ilaha illallah means. But they're not sure that it's true. They know what it means. So that's knowledge. But they're not sure that it's true. And so this is the second condition, that a person has certainty. And certainty is the opposite of doubt. So they don't have any doubt whatsoever about the meaning of la ilaha illallah and what it indicates being true, that it is truth. And Allah Azza wa Jal has addressed this or talked about this in some ayat in the Quran. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا The believers are only those who have believed in Allah and his messenger and then they don't have any doubt about that their faith 
in Allah Azza wa Jal and in the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is unwavering. Is unwavering. So here, what we gain from this is that in order for one's Iman to be correct and to be valid, then they have to have certainty in La ilaha illallah. And this is a condition. Likewise, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anni Rasulullah. I bear witness. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except for Allah. And that I am the messenger of Allah. لا يلقى الله بهما عبد غير شاك فيهما إلا دخل الجنة. There is no one, no servant, no slave of Allah who meets Allah without having any doubt in them. That is the two testimonies of faith, except that he enters Jannah. So what condition did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put on the Shahadatain here? He said, whoever meets Allah without having any doubt about them. So here, this, this is a condition for the acceptance of La ilaha illallah that a person has no doubt about its truthfulness and that he has absolute certainty. So there is no Iman for the one who says La ilaha illallah and he doubts and he doubts about it. The third condition, al ilmu wal yaqinu wal qabulu. Yani that he accepts, that he accepts la ilaha illallah. What, what does that mean, an acceptance? You may have some people who know the meaning of la ilaha illallah and they are certain that it's true. If you ask them about it, I say, I have no doubt that La ilaha illallah is true, but they don't accept it. Meaning that they don't accept the fact that they have to follow this way and what La ilaha illallah requires of them from belief in Allah and belief in the book that he sent to the Prophet وسلم, and belief in following the Messenger وسلم, they say, I don't accept that for whatever reason some people don't accept it because they're too proud some people don't accept it because they're scared they're scared of what other people are going to say about them they're scared of what's going to happen to them after they take shahada they're scared of what social pressures may come down on them they're scared to lose their job or whatever the reason might be so they they don't accept they know and they are certain, but they don't accept it. And they don't put themselves under the banner of Islam. And this is something that is critical. Even for, even for those who may have been raised as Muslims, but, and they know that la ilaha illallah is the truth and they are certain about that, but they don't, at, at some point in their lives, they reject and they don't accept. They reject and don't accept for whatever reason. And so a person may do that because they, again, they're too proud or they're scared or for whatever other dunyawi, worldly reason that they may not uh, accept la ilaha illallah. Maybe, maybe it is a person who is married and they don't want to, as they would say, destroy the marriage. And so they don't accept la ilaha illallah. Likewise, there are some people, as we mentioned before, that just pick and choose what they want. And this also does not indicate full acceptance of la ilaha illallah. Because Allah Azza wa Jalla in the Quran, He actually yani, mentioned the Jews in a blameworthy light and criticized them and condemned them for this reason. He said, Is it that you believe in part of the book 
and that you reject the other part? So a Muslim, a Muslim, in order to be a Muslim, in order for La ilaha illallah to benefit him, then he has to accept Islam in its totality. Everything that Allah Azza wa Jalla has informed us of, that we accept it. And everything that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informed us of, we accept it. We accept what comes in the Quran. And we accept the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If a person rejects one ayah in the Quran, then they have not accepted La ilaha illallah. Now, does that mean that a person may, for example, he may reject a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, not because he knows that the Prophet ﷺ said it and he rejects it, but because he doubts, is this hadith authentic or not? Because the scholars of Islam may differ about certain statements of the Prophet ﷺ or certain actions. But that's a different, that's a different topic altogether. So if a scholar differs with another scholar and he says, no, this hadith is not authentic. There's not an authentic chain of narrators, for example. So he rejects the hadith. He's not rejecting the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu But there are other people who will come and they will say, I don't, they, 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 this person will say that he doesn't accept the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Why? Because he has allowed himself and subjected his hearing and subjected his mind to those studies of the Orientalists and others who have come and placed doubts in the minds of the Muslim about the preservation of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Believe me, Ikhwan, that the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is preserved. It has been preserved. We don't need to look at Bukhari and Muslim and think that they were the first ones to record the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The companions themselves wrote down the statements of the Prophet ﷺ. And many of them memorized the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ the way that the others would memorize the Quran. And this is what they dedicated their lives to. They didn't play video games. They didn't hang out at night entertaining themselves with cards and checkers and chess and watching football and cricket. They dedicated their lives to preserving the deen of Islam. This is what they dedicated their lives to, Ikhwan. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who slept in the masjid, in this masjid, so that he wouldn't miss anything that the Prophet sallallahu was saying or that he did. And there were others of the companions, his wives, like Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, who preserved for us what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did even in his home, even his interactions with his wives, even the way he ate sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even what he did before and after he would have intimate relations with his wives. All of this is recorded and it has been preserved with solid chains of men and women who were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve this deen. So we should have no doubt about that as Muslims. And anybody that comes and says otherwise, then we reject it and we don't listen to them and we don't subject ourselves to having those doubts creep into our hearts. And it's not to say that, because now they say that this is the the era of discussion and that you tell me what you want to say and I'll tell you what I like to say and then we can figure out who's on the truth a man came to Imam Malik and he wanted to debate him and Imam Malik said to him okay what happens if I win the debate the man said then I'll follow you and Imam Malik says, well, what happens if you win the debate? The man said, then you follow me. So Imam Malik said, well, what if a third person comes along and he, wins, he beats both of us in the debate? He said that we'll follow him. He said, this deen is one path and I know my deen and if you don't know yours, then go look for it. 
If you don't know what your religion is, then go look for it. I know my deen. I'm not going to subject myself. If every time one person comes that knows how to debate better than the other person, we leave what the Prophet ﷺ came with and we follow him? Is that, is that what the religion of Islam is? So just because someone may be able to speak better or may be, able, may be better at the art of convincing, then we leave what we know to be the haq, what we know to be the truth that the Prophet ﷺ came with and we follow this person? No. So everyone knows their own limits and they know their, the limit to their knowledge of Islam. And so what happens is those people will send missionaries and others to the Muslims that they know are not firm in their knowledge of Islam. They're just average Muslims, which is okay. Which is okay. For a Muslim to know La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that's what he needs. Along with these conditions that we're talking about, that's what a person needs to enter into Jannah. And they don't need to subject themselves to these other things. But the minute that you find a Muslim scholar and a non-Muslim scholar, why in the history of Islam you don't find the scholars of Islam going to any other religion? It doesn't exist. Not the scholars of Islam. They never left Islam and went to any other way of life. But the ulama of the Jews, they came to Islam. Like Abdullah ibn Salam, the Allah ta'ala The great companion of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was from the scholars of the Jews. He came to Islam. And you look throughout the history, you will find many scholars of Christianity up until today that were scholars in Christianity, that graduated from the best seminaries and the best divinity schools, but they come to Islam, but vice versa doesn't happen. The point is here that we have to accept, this is the third condition, the acceptance of la ilaha illallah and everything that it requires. And that we follow, we accept the entirety of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The fourth condition is al inqiyat So what's the first condition? Knowledge. Second condition? Certainty. The third condition? Acceptance. The fourth condition is compliance. al inqiyat Compliance. To apply what you know from Islam or from la ilaha illallah. That you comply to that statement. And, and what this means What the scholars mean when they say compliance to la ilaha illallah is that this person worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. He singles out Allah as well in worship and he applies the sharia and complies to the sharia and he believes that it is the truth. This has to be present in order for one to be considered to have uh, complied to the sunnah, to the, to the statement, la ilaha illallah. As for one simply verbalizing, la ilaha illallah, they know what it means. And they are certain that it is the truth. And they say it, they accept it. And so they say, la ilaha illallah. But then they don't do anything. Or they worship other than Allah. Then they have not fulfilled this condition of la ilaha illallah, which is the condition of compliance. We need to understand as well. Allah Azza wa Jalla said in the Quran, "وَمَنْ يُسْلِمْ وَجَهَهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ فَقَدْ إِسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى وَإِلَى اللَّهِ عَقِيبَةُ الْأُمُورِ." Whoever, whoever yuslim wajahu submits himself to Allah. يعني that is that he complies with the Sharia. وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ that is that he does this action for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, does his deeds for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, then he has held on firmly to the firm, to, to the, to the urwat al wuthqa which the scholars of tafsir say is la ilaha illallah. So whoever complies with the sharia and worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, then he has held on to la ilaha illallah. The opposite is also the case. He who does not comply to the sharia and does not worship Allah alone, then he has not held on to la ilaha illallah. Here, Ikhwan, we need to understand something. There's a very important point here. And that is that 
this compliance is negated by two things. One, that somebody worships other than Allah. Any shirk will contradict the statement of La ilaha illallah. Anytime someone worships other than Allah, then that will contradict their statement of La ilaha illallah. It means that that statement hasn't benefited them. Or if a person doesn't worship Allah at all, how does that work? Someone says, La ilaha illallah. I know what it means. I accept it as being the truth. And I've said La ilaha illallah. But this person then, this person then doesn't do anything from the pillars of Islam. So they don't pray, and they don't give zakat, and they don't fast in Ramadan, and they don't make hajj. Then this person is not a Muslim. Even if they say, La ilaha illallah, day and night. Because this person, in fact, has turned away tawalli, which is the opposite of inqiyat. This person has turned away from the religion in totality. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ We have not sent a messenger except that he be obeyed by the permission of Allah. So every, the deen has to have ibadah, it has to have ta'ah, there has to be some type of obedience. Without that, then la ilaha illallah does not hold any weight for the individual that said it. This point needs to be clear. This is not about the issue of the difference of opinion amongst the scholars. Does the one who leaves off prayer, is he a Muslim or not? No, this, this, this is not that issue. This is the issue of one who doesn't practice any of the pillars of Islam. Allah Azawajal says in the Quran, وَيَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالرَّسُولِ وَاطَعْنَا ثُمَّ يَتَوَلَّى فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمْ مِّنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ وَمَا أُولَٰئِكَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ They say that we believe in Allah and the Messenger and we've obeyed and then a group of them turn away after that. Turn away from what? Turn away from doing anything. From the actions that are specific to Islam, they turn away from it. And then Allah Azawajal says, وَمَا أُولَٰئِكَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ And they are not believers. They are not believers. So what needs to be understood from this is that the deen must have some degree, some degree of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order for it to be considered to be valid. And this is why the scholars of Islam and from amongst them, Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned that it is inconceivable, inconceivable for one to have any degree of proper iman that will benefit him on the day of judgment and then he doesn't practice any of the arkan of Islam. It's inconceivable. It is impossible. Why? Why? Because somewhere in this person's knowledge or in their certainty or in their acceptance, there is a deficiency, major deficiency. Otherwise, they would comply. Otherwise, they would comply. There would be compliance. There would be some type of action. That that knowledge that they have and that certainty and their acceptance would have to push them to do something from the pillars of Islam. Other than that, then a person is not considered to be a Muslim in La ilaha illallah. If they sing it day and night, it will not hold any weight for them. The fifth condition is the condition of a siddiq. That is that a person is truthful in his statement of la ilaha illallah. Meaning that what he is saying on his tongue coincides with what is in his heart. That it's the same thing. So this has to be present in order for la ilaha illallah to benefit someone. Otherwise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has detailed for us the situation of the munafiqeen in the Quran. Those hypocrites. The hypocrites, didn't they say La ilaha illallah? But did it benefit them? Inna al-munafiqeen, Allah says in the Quran. Inna al-munafiqeen fi 
الدرك الأسفل من النار They are the, the hip indeed The hypocrites are in the lowest level of the hellfire But they said La ilaha illallah They said it They didn't just say La ilaha illallah They said Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah as well But it didn't benefit them Why? Because they weren't truthful Meaning Meaning that what they said on their tongue did not coincide with what was in the heart. Allah Azawajal says in the Quran, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ وَأَمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that from amongst the people there are those that say we believe in Allah and we believe in the last day and they are not believers and they are not believers they attempt to deceive Allah and those who and those who believe but they are only deceiving themselves and they know not Allah subhanahu wa also said in the Quran إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ والله يعلم إنك لرسوله والله يشهد إن المنافقين مكاذبون When the munafiqeen come to you they say we testify that you are the messenger of Allah and Allah knows that you are his messenger and Allah testifies that they are liars that they are liars so it's not about just saying it off the tongue one has to be truthful in what he says and we have modern day examples of that we have examples of a man who wants to marry this beautiful Muslim woman that he goes to college with. And she loves him as well. Wallahu al-musta'an. For those of you who send your children away to these type of institutions where they are being tested by Allah day and night. And she says, Daddy, Daddy, but I want, I want to marry him. I'm in love with him. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And the man says, okay. We can make this right. How do we make it right? Just tell the guy, huh, he has to be a Muslim. Well, what does he have to, do to be a, have to do to be a Muslim? Just tell him, say, La ilaha illallah. On the Muhammad Rasulullah. Khalas. Huh? We know these type of stories. It happens. Where a person only says, like, he's not, he, doesn't, he doesn't believe it. He's not being truthful with his tongue. But he's saying, La ilaha illallah, because he wants something from the dunya. Maybe someone is in a situation, he's living in the Muslim world, and he wants to get the, free, the benefits of being a Muslim in that area. So he says, well, while I'm here, I might as well say, La ilaha illallah, but he's not being truthful. So truthful is a con being truthful is a condition for the acceptance of La ilaha illallah. I think this is clear. I think this is clear. That a person who says La ilaha illallah, but he's not truthful, then it is of no benefit to him on the day of judgment. The sixth condition. Uh, what, what are the five so that we don't forget them? Huh? What's the first one? Knowledge. Second. Certainty. Third. Acceptance. Fourth. Compliance. And fifth. Truthfulness. Right, the sixth is sincerity, which is very close to the one that has preceded. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said for in Allah Harama al Nari Min Kala La ilaha illallah Yaba Tari Vidalika Wajhallah because indeed Allah has prohibited the fire for the one who says La ilaha illallah intending by that the face of Allah. He wants to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this statement. And the Prophet Wasallam when he was asked, Who is the one who is most deserving of your shafa? on the day of judgment. Who is the one who is most deserving of your intercession on the day of judgment? The Prophet Sallallahu said, من قال لا إله إلا الله خالصا من قلبه He who says لا إله إلا الله sincerely from his heart. So he doesn't want any aspect of the dunya. He doesn't want anything other than the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by this statement when he says, La ilaha illallah. Which is close to being truthful, but it's a bit different. Because one may sincerely believe, La ilaha illallah. Or they know what it means, 
but they are saying it they are saying it and their tongue is not in compliance or it, it is does not coincide with was in their heart Whereas the one who is sincere Afwan, the issue of sincerity perhaps someone is saying la ilaha illallah but they're showing off by saying it by accepting islam or they want money or something like this so they in this sense, they are not being sincere in their statement of La ilaha illallah. The last of the conditions is that a person loves La ilaha illallah and everything that it requires of them. They love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost. And they love the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we talked about this yesterday. This aspect of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and loving the Messenger and loving the people of La ilaha illallah. Loving the people of La ilaha illallah and everything that La ilaha illallah requires of us. This is actually from the usul or from the foundations of our iman. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La yu'minu ahadukum hatta kuna habba ilayhi min walidihi wa walidihi wa nasi ajma'een. None of you will believe until I am more beloved to him than his father, his children, or his parents and his children, and all of mankind. And Allah Azawajal says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ For almost the people, there are those who take rivals with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, And he set up rivals. And they love them the way that they love Allah, but the believers are more intense and their love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the conditions that must be fulfilled in order for la ilaha illallah to benefit the one who says it. And again, this is not an issue of us memorizing these conditions and running around and telling people, have you fulfilled the conditions of la ilaha illallah? Let's see, do you know, let's test everybody. Do you know the conditions of la ilaha illallah? No, this is not why we're learning this. We learn this because we want to make sure that we, when we, our testimony is correct. And the best way, the best way to ensure that we, that our testimony is correct is to increase in the knowledge of this deen. And that is also the best way to push away any shubuhat or doubtful matters and other things that people may try to, uh, or, or creep into the religion and take one away from one certainty of the deen of Islam. The eighth condition, and I said that there were seven, the eighth condition that was mentioned by the author rahimahullah ta'ala is that one rejects everything that is worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this in fact, this in fact, is contained in the meaning of la ilaha illallah itself. And the author rahimahullah ta'ala and the other scholars who mentioned this as, a, as an eighth condition of la ilaha illallah do so because of its importance. Because it's extremely important for one to realize that everything has to be rejected besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wallahu a'lam.
Then the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, after talking about the conditions of La ilaha illallah, went on to talk about the meaning of Muhammad Rasulullah, which we discussed in detail yesterday, or in some detail. And then he went on to mention that after one has learned the meanings of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and knows the conditions of the Shahada, then it is important for him to learn the remaining pillars of Islam as Salah, as Zakat, as Sawm, and Al Hajj. And there is no time to go into detail about each of these pillars. But what I do want to say is that when we bear witness to La ilaha illallah, that Allah is the only one to be worshipped or the only one deserving of worship and we testify to this and we testify that Muhammad sallallahu is the messenger of Allah then it is upon us to worship Allah and it's not if we just say it and then there's no worship okay then we haven't fulfilled the condition of la ilaha illallah in the first place and there's no better way to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather the only way to worship Allah جل, is the way that he has prescribed for us because he created us and he knows what is best for us in terms of that worship and what is going to be beneficial for us because Allah جل, doesn't benefit anything from our ibadah if no one was to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that wouldn't take away from the dominion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anything it wouldn't take anything away from Allah's dominion but he has prescribed for us these ibadat or these acts of devotion that benefit us. And this is why when a person prays, he feels better. When he makes dua, he feels better. Fasting in the month of Ramadan, he feels closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He feels like his iman has risen. He feels like a different individual. When he finishes making hajj and while he's making the hajj, he doesn't feel the same way that he felt before. He feels better because these doing these acts of ibadah purify the individual. And so what I want to do is read a very brief uh, description of these pillars of Islam. Because all of the other ibadahs really kind of go back to these pillars. Yani Umrah goes back to Hajj. We're going to fast, inshallah ta'ala, on Ashura. Fast on Yom Arafah, for example. Fast on Mondays and Thursdays. All of this goes back to the general ibadah of fasting. Yani that obligatory act of ibadah. And there are other acts of, of worship and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But these are the main ones. And these, that is why the Prophet sallallahu said that Islam is built upon them. Uh, built, uh, built upon these pillars. So I want to read something to you that the great scholar, Badr al-Din al-Zarqashi, rahimahullah ta'ala, said as it relates to the pillars of Islam. He says, when we reflect on these five pillars, we should appreciate that each one of them deals with an important aspect related to man. That each one of these pillars, that is Salat and Zakat and fasting and Hajj, relate to or deal with an important aspect related to man. And that each one makes up a strong and firm pillar in the house of Islam. A house that no one stays in except for the believer. So the phrase of Tawheed, the phrase of Tawheed, La ilaha illallah, therefore wholly engages the heart while it affects surface on the limbs. That is that when the heart is consumed with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hoping in Allah azza wa jal's mercy, when it is consumed with that, this is the ibadah of the heart. This is the worship of the heart and then its effects are seen on the limbs. The prayer uses all of the limbs. That is that the prayer is a physical act of worship. A person uses his body. It doesn't cost you anything to pray. You don't have to give anything away. 
when you pray. But you are using your body physically, a physical act of devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is the strong and firm link between the creature and his creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim's relation to other Muslims is solidified by way of those who have giving to those who do not have. That is the zakat. So a person also gets rid of his stinginess and he purifies the wealth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him by engaging in this monetary form of ibadah. So a person is purifying his body through the salat and purifying his money through zakat. A person is comprised of soul and body and that body has desires. How does one how does one gain control of his desires? So here we have the issue of if man were left to himself, he would stray far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why Allah Azza wa Jal legislated fasting for us. It is fasting where a person now comes and he regulates. He regulates his desires. He regulates his desire to eat, his desire to drink, his desire to be with his spouse. All of these things are halal for him in general. But he controls himself and does not even approach those things that Allah has made halal for him. And so therefore he is able to control himself better when it comes to those things that Allah has prohibited. See, so a person now is training his soul. And this is the only form of ibadah that requires that you don't do anything. Ibadah to tarq. What do you do when you fast? You do nothing. You don't do anything. You stay away from certain things. And so this is a different form of worship than prayer and a different form than the zakat. Do you see the hikmah in these things? So Allah Azza wa Jal is helping us to become better by making these pillars of, of Islam. After the heart has been filled with faith, so when we fast, our soul is cleansed and polished and after the heart has been filled with faith and after wealth is distributed, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated, the ties come, time comes for societal ties to be strengthened in the Islamic world and that occurs during the huge, what he calls the huge national conference, if you will, of Hajj International, when the Muslims come from all over the world. And Hajj as well is one of the main, main ways that we gain in our love and following of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because we follow in his footsteps on each of those days of Hajj and we renew our testimony that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Messenger of Allah. We can also view the pillars from another perspective. The Shahada is a test for the heart. Prayer is a test for the limbs and for a Muslim's ability to organize himself in his time. Zakat is a test for man and his wealth. And the fast is a test to see the degree that one is able to leave his desires for the sake of, sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his creator and his Lord. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in, in the end of Nazi'at, as for the one who fears the status of his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and the standing before his Lord and he prevents his soul from hawa, from desires and lust then Jannah is his abode and the Hajj is a test to see how much one is able to bear the hardship and difficulties of traveling in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and other than that. That is benefited from, it's not the exact speech of an Imam Zarkashi, rahimahullah ta'ala, but it's benefited from uh, what he has said. And there are other scholars who have said similar things. The point is here to get a general understanding of the wisdom, the supreme wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in legislating these five as the pillars of Islam.
And so we need to hold on firm to them and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the people of la ilaha illallah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the people whose last speech in this dunya is la ilaha illallah. Allahumma aslih lana deena lana ladhi huwa ismatu amnina wa aslih lana dunya na lati fiha ma'ashuna wa aslih lana akhiratana lati ilayha ma'aduna wa ja'al al-hayata ziyadata lana fi kulli sha... fi kulli wa ja'al al-hayata ziyadata lana fi kulli khair wal mawta rahata lana min kulli shar wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyina muhammad subhanak allahumma bihamdik ashharu wa la ilaha ila ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk